All right there, Econ friends, welcome back to our next video. So in our previous video, we were discussing game theory, jumped into that with a lot of new ideas, some jargon, but critically the idea of a payoff matrix, okay? Big thing to point out, we had said in the last video that game theory has two broad types of games, simultaneous move and sequential move. What I taught you in the last video the payoff matrix that was designed to illustrate and model simultaneous move. In this video, I wanna teach you just a really quick tool called a decision tree that will help you to understand sequential move games, okay? So let's jump into it. Um, actually, before we jump into it, one quick intro note. Um, this is really powerful. And from a strategy lens, Decision trees, if you can get your head around them, are really helpful in lots of areas of life. Anytime you're contemplating multiple actions that will have multiple reactions or counteractions by others, decision trees can really help you to lay it out. It's, it's tough to learn and it's sort of tough to internalize, but if you can get to a point where you can kind of start thinking about decisions in the lens of decision trees, even if you don't actually draw them out, you'll really be well prepared to make better decisions in your life, okay? So with that little disclaimer, let's jump in. And like I just said, sequential move games, so that's what we're talking about now, sequential move games, they can be modeled by using decision trees. A decision tree is a graphical representation of a sequential move game that, as the model says, will model out different actions and their payoffs, okay? You have one right here. This is basically a decision tree that shows the same data as was given in the last video with Romeo and Juliet. Okay, remember they had to decide, do I make three or do I make four? In the last model, we assume that the decisions were made simultaneously, so we put them in a payoff matrix. Here, we're gonna assume that Romeo decides first, that Juliet can see Romeo's decision, and that based on that, Juliet then makes a decision after. So in other words, this would model out or mock up or illustrate decisions in which a person makes a decision and then based on that, the second player makes their decision. You can have really complicated decision trees that can go for multiple decision rounds, but here today we're gonna to keep it simple with two, okay? Let's first break this down you see that it starts off right here, question one, with Romeo saying, what do I do? Do I make three or do I make four? And what we do is we break off different branches on this tree. Romeo can decide in this branch to make three and decide in this branch to make four. Once Romeo makes his decision on either three or four, then sequentially, Juliet makes a decision. Her decision also has branches in this tree. So if again, Romeo makes three, then Juliet, actually let's do it this way, then we're on our second decision and Juliet can decide whether to make three or four. Decision one would be three, decision two would be four. And if Romeo decides to make four, then we land down here. Romeo made four, so now Juliet decides whether to make three or whether to make four. So we have the same data that we had in the payoff matrix, but the analysis is subtly different because now it's sequential. So now what's gonna happen is Juliet is gonna have to decide what to do, okay? Notice here that we have the same payoffs. If, let's do this in black, this is column three, which is the actual payoff. 
If Romeo decides to make three and Juliet makes three, then Romeo makes 18 and Juliet makes 18. And if Romeo made three and Juliet made four, then Romeo makes 15 and Juliet 20, and you get the rest of it, okay? So once you understand that, then what you do is you jump into analyzing it. And the critical skill that I want you to take away from this is that when you analyze a decision tree, the best and most effective way to do it, well, first, you have to actually draw out the appropriate tree. But once you've drawn the appropriate tree, the best way to analyze it is to work backward. In other words, you use a tool called backward induction. Okay. And this is really powerful because again, like I said earlier, these decision trees are not just things in econ classes. These are common all over business, all over military, all over courts of law, all over diplomacy, all over personal life. Anytime different entities have to make strategic decisions, you can map them out on a tree and this can help you think better. Okay, so how do we think? We think backwards. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means this. Up here, we said that Romeo decides first and Juliet decides second. Since Romeo decides first and Juliet decides second, we're gonna go backwards. We're gonna analyze Juliet's decision first and then Romeo's decision after. Okay, let's do it here. So, Juliet, we're going to analyze her decision first. Juliet is going to say, if Romeo made three, Juliet will say, I can make three or I can make four. And Juliet will decide that if she makes three, she'll earn $18. And if she makes four, she'll earn 20 so we would conclude that Juliet would say, yep, in this case, I'm gonna make four. Juliet could also analyze the branch of the tree where Romeo makes four. Juliet would say, if I make three, I'll earn $15. And if I make four, I'll earn $16. Since 16 is better than 15, Juliet would say here, I'm gonna make four. Notice that on the decision tree, we've arrived again at a dominant strategy. And that dominant strategy is Juliet will produce four. Now that we know Juliet's decision, we work backwards and we think through Romeo's decision. Remember, Romeo decided first, Juliet second, so we model backward by analyzing Juliet first, then Romeo. We've determined that Juliet is gonna make four. So since we know that Juliet is gonna make four, Romeo's decision is simply this. He says, hmm, what should I do? Romeo can make three, in which case he pulls $15, or Romeo can make four, in which case he pulls 16. Remember, Romeo was making his decision having already modeled out and predicted that Juliet's gonna make four. So Romeo's decision is all around, how does my decision, given her producing four, work out for me? And if Romeo produces three, he makes 15. If he produces four, he makes 16. Since 16 is better than 15, Romeo will produce four. And notice that this lands us exactly where we were on our payoff matrix with a Q of four and a Q of four. Those are the dominant strategies. We just illustrated them in different ways, okay? Finally, I just wanna summarize and give a quick example. The big summary here, the thing to walk away with is that while they're complicated and they're not and they're not intuitive and you have to put the time in to learn how to think this way, game theory and especially prisoner's dilemma, they have really broad applications 
throughout all of business, most of your personal life, lots of military, lots of criminal justice, legal, lots of diplomacy. Increasingly, we're even identifying cases where evolutionary forces can be modeled, you know, in evolutionary biology on game theory, okay? What are some of the applications? Well, there's many. I'm gonna wrap this video up by giving you just one example, and this is the decision to advertise. Now, in our last video series on monopolistic competition, you recall that we introduced advertising. And you might recall that at the end of that video, we asked the question, is advertising good or bad? And some economists feel, okay, not all, but some economists feel that advertising is bad primarily because it's wasteful. And in fact, a lot of business owners also believe that advertising is wasteful because advertising is really expensive. Remember, my friends, profit is equal to P minus ATC times Q. Advertising is very expensive and can potentially jack your cost of production up and lower your profits. So a lot of business owners honestly would prefer to not advertise. So if they would prefer to not advertise, the simple question comes up, then why do they advertise? And we can answer that through game theory. Let's just take a look over here. We can do it over here with the decision matrix. And I invite you when I'm done with my thing to give it a shot. But let's start here. Let's take panel B. Let's take a decision payoff matrix for the decision of whether to advertise or not. We have two players. We have Coke. And we have Pepsi, the duopoly of soda, right? Each player can decide to advertise or not advertise. To advertise, to not advertise. Note that we're going to have, again, four potential outputs, four potential solutions. These would be boxes one, two, three, and four. Note that in box one, not individual, but for the unit as a whole, for the cartel as a whole, for the oligopoly as a whole, in box one, if both Coke and Pepsi say, let's not advertise, they would generate total profits of let's say 200. In box two, 175. In box three, 175. And box four sucks. Box four is the worst outcome. If they both decide to advertise, advertise and advertise, and they meet in this box, they would both suffer. They would only make $150 total profit, okay? So clearly we would say in economic theory, let me reduce this down a little bit, that the cooperative solution, in other words, the optimal solution for Coke and Pepsi would be box one, don't advertise, save that money, boost your profits. But will that happen? And the answer is no. Because if you were to take this, met, uh, this payoff matrix and tease it apart, you would find that both Coke and Pepsi, even though box one is optimal, they both face a dominant strategy. And that dominant strategy sadly for their profit lines is to advertise. You don't believe it? Let's take a quick look. Let's just say hypothetically that Coke decides to not advertise. So let's go to red for contrast. Coke can say, we're not gonna advertise. If Coke does not advertise and Pepsi doesn't, Pepsi makes $100. If Coke does not advertise and Pepsi does, Pepsi steals market share and they make 125. Pepsi in this case is taking advantage of Coke. Let's now say, let's go to black for contrast. 
that Coke decides to advertise. Pepsi can decide to not advertise and only make 50. Pepsi can decide to advertise and make 75. You see where I'm going with this? Regardless of what Coke does, Pepsi's best bet, advertise. Because 125 is greater than 100 and 75 is greater than 50. So Pepsi's dominant strategy, advertise. And if you run the numbers, you would see that so is Coke's. So instead of landing at box one, which would have been ideal, they both advertise and they land right here in box four and life sucks for both of them. You might ask yourself, why do some countries continue to invest in nuclear weapons? Why do some firms advertise? Why did some countries invade other countries? Why do some organisms have symbiotic things with other organisms? All these random things that seem very, very separate and very different, they can all be unified, thought through, through the same lens of game theory. I've given you here one example, the example in business, because many of you guys are business majors and marketing majors, but this is a powerful tool that can apply across the board. With that, my friends, we're done with game theory. So we're done finally with our first model, the cartel model. We know what cartel is, and now you really critically can think through why they work and why they don't. And hopefully you have a lot more mental power to make better, more strategic decisions for yourself. In our next video, we're gonna wrap up with two quick minor models of oligopoly, and then you'll be done. Thanks for tuning in, my friends, and I'll see you next time.